Hi, welcome to this week's edition of The Point. I'm guest host Jimmy Dore sitting in for Anna Kasper, and he's on assignment in New York City, I think. What are we talking about? Well, right now, let's before we get to the show, let's do my no-filter monologue. So Dick Cheney isn't dead yet. Recently, the former vice president was interviewed by Sanjay Gupta on 60 Minutes. They call it 60 Minutes because there's nobody younger than 60 watching. The segment showed the 72-year-old former vice president being the beneficiary of the latest in heart transplant technology. 60 Minutes mistook this for a human interest story. The one-time Halliburton CEO was shown vacationing and relaxing on his 1,700-acre Wyoming ranch a retirement financed by the American people and a multi-million dollar package from Halliburton. Dick Cheney has survived five different heart attacks. The first one was when he found out his daughter knew all the lyrics to the Indigo Girls songs. In each of these heart attacks, innovations in medical technology showed up just in time to save Dick Cheney's life, thus disproving the theory of karma. At age 71, Dick Cheney received a brand new heart in a transplant operation. That's right, war veterans are coming home without arms or legs, and Dick Cheney gets a new heart because I'm told medical experts agreed they couldn't give him a soul transplant. Cheney lives without fear of being prosecuted for war crimes, but lives in fear that after a bean burrito dinner, a fart might blow up his pacemaker. Former Vice President Dick Cheney is under the supervision of a doctor who keeps an endless supply of children's hearts on ice just in case. It's only fair because thanks to Dick Cheney, there's more organ donors in the world, especially ones that go hunting with him. This all comes as a huge disappointment to all the people who wanted to piss on Cheney's grave. Unlike me, I'd like to piss on Cheney while he's still alive, but that's enough about my sexual fantasies. The sad truth is, thanks to his pact with Satan, Dick Cheney will outlive us all. And that's my no filter for this week. We've got a great show lined up for you. Today, our first topic, we're gonna talk about how the media polices itself. Just how good of a job does it do is the question. I'll give you a hint for the answer, not good. Okay. <laughs> um, we're also going to talk about the reports that insurance companies are sending out letters to people and uh, scaring them that they're going to have to drop their health insurance and get more expensive health coverage. And it's all, uh, it's all an, an effort to undermine Obamacare. We're going to talk about that. Plus, John Stewart and the nation's political discourse. Is he just a comedian? Or is he much, much more? Howard Kurtz has some thoughts on it. We're going to talk about that. And uh, finally, we're going to talk about the new hipster Christianity, right? The hipsters. They're going to try and make Jesus hip and cool. And, uh, you know, let's face it, he did, uh, he did have uh, long hair and a beard, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, I'm, and he liked Zach Galifianakis. So uh, <laughs> we're going to get to that. First, let's meet our panel. Uh, first up is Jenny Churchill. She's the producer with Pivot TV's Take Part Live. Uh, she's also worked previously for HuffPost Live on the RT Network, and she sometimes visits us here at TYT to see what it's like when people don't know the names of shows. It's Jenny <laughs> Churchill. Hi, Jenny. How are you? Hi. Good. How are you? Thanks for coming in. Appreciate you having, having you. I, I, purple is my favorite color this week. I didn't know that. I, I, wore purple I wouldn't have yesterday. worn it if I'd known. No, I love it. I love <laughs> no, it. I know. Next to her, John Ayerola is the host of TYT University and the common room here at the TYT Network. Not to be confused with Johnny Fontaine totally different from person. The Godfather. That's a different guy. Hi, John. How are you? I'm doing good. Yeah. Where do you Glad get that? we pushed past those names. It's yeah. a fantastic shirt. Thank you. Yeah, I got it at the mall, actually. It's nice. Yeah. That's not oh, the yeah, mall. Yeah, and very cheap. You'll be surprised to find out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Next to him, it's uh, our executive producer of The Point. Uh, and someone we've wanted on the show for a long, long yeah. time. And he's not at all a last-minute replacement yes. for uh, someone who had to go on Larry King's show. Okay. And my name, my name uh, by the way, is Malcolm Fleshner. Jimmy left that out. But, uh, uh, <laughs> he would have gotten it wrong anyway, so don't worry. <laughs> oh, that's not, that's not what it says here. <laughs> do, you, do you call jo Johnny Fontaine because they're both Italian? Is, that, is it the Italian thing? I think it's a racist thing. You think it's yeah, a, I think it's, it's racially. Uh, just because I could, yes, <laughs> okay. it is. It's about... Uh, mm -hmm. But you're Irish. You grew up with a lot of Italians, I'm sure. And so yeah, so I'm Irish, so I know the criminality of Italians. Yeah. So... I, 
All right. So let's get to our first segment, shall we? Uh, okay. Who's watching the watchdog? That's my question. So we've heard a lot of stories about Obamacare that's being broadcast on the news. They're all pretty much false and incorrect about people losing their health care because of Obamacare and getting worse in coverage or, or more expensive coverage. Sean Hannity uh, is probably the most famous one who did this. He had on a panel of three different couples. They came on to talk about their problems with Obamacare, and they turned out to be uh, incorrect. There was a reporter, uh, Eric Stern, he decided to fact check the Sean Hannity piece. Turned out none of those people knew what the hell they were talking about, and uh, they weren't gonna get worse insurance. In fact, they were gonna get better insurance. Well, guess what? Reliable sources on CNN decided to bring on that reporter, Eric Stern, to talk about his investigation of the bogus story that was on the Sean Hannity show. And let's look at some of the curious questions David Folkenflik, the guest host of Reliable Sources, had for Eric Stern. The Democratic lawyer and writer Eric Stern joins me now from Bozeman, Montana. Eric, welcome and thanks for joining us. Hi, hi, David. How you doing? I'm doing fine. You know, picking up the phone and calling people strikes me as doing actual reporting. What, what inspired you to do this after seeing this piece? Uh, you know, because I was watching it and it just didn't sound right. It didn't smell right what these folks were saying and what Han how Hannity was casting it. Now, to be clear, as it's as is known, and you've disclosed, you know, you're a former aide to the Democratic governor of Montana. You have an interest in this. Sean Hannity, well-known conservative, he's an opinion host. Why would you expect him to be a guy who's uh, going to go after precision in re reflecting some concerns about uh, an act that he opposes? I, I didn't expect him. I, I, everybody, it's not news that he's full of it. I just thought that <laughs> at least you can't make something up out of whole cloth. You have to have at least a modicum of fact you know, to base even a even a bias story around. And this one didn't even have that. Well, you know, I mean, they might argue that this is true to the experiences of these people. You know, for them, they may actually distrust the government to uh, oversee this private uh, uh, health care insurance exchanges. Why isn't that simply true to their experience? Aren't they entitled to that? They, they absolutely are entitled to it. But Hannity is not entitled to point to what they're saying as evidence of a train wreck and that Obamacare is currently failing. He's reporting on something that hasn't even happened yet. Hannity is, is, is a more distinctive Republican uh, and fixed figure than perhaps some of their other hosts. Uh, and I'm sure they're, they're news anchors. You know, what you're going to see on Shep Smith might be somewhat different than what you're going to see on Hannity. At the same time, it seems as though uh, what you found here is an opinion host who's presenting something as fact that you say Stray is far from it. Correct. He, he, that's, a, that's exactly what he was doing. Well, a guy like Hannity is essentially the, the, sure. sort of the director of the right-wing information ministry in this country, well, and that's just propaganda. It's pure propaganda. Well, it led to a very interesting article in your part and the interesting impulse to pick up the phone and figure out what the facts actually were. Now, what I find curious about David Fulkenflik's qu line of questioning is that his questioning wasn't to illuminate how wrong uh, Sean Hannity's reporting was or how bad the media has been doing on reporting Obamacare. His line of questioning pushed whether or, or not the debunking of Sean Hannity was correct or not. So instead of talking about how bad of a segment Sean Hannity did, we talked about whether what Sean Hannity did was right or wasn't right, which is a bullshit question, I think. I'm gonna throw it to Jenny, get what she thinks about it. What do you think about that line of questioning? Well, I think it's interesting and I think it's really telling about the state of media today because what you're looking at is a situation where you have news and commentary and trying to decipher the two, but it doesn't matter if you're doing commentary and you're telling lies. Right. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, You can put your own opinion on things, you can spin things, you can pick out the pieces of the facts you want, but you can't just lie to the general public. So I think that was kind of what was missing in the discussion. I, I agree with you. And it just seems like David Folkenflik thinks that uh, maybe you shouldn't hold people's feet to the fire. Now, John, when, when he was, first of all, he asked her to introduce him. Now, if you were interviewing Eric Stern, mm -hmm. would you introduce him? Now, you're a Democrat, so you obviously have an interest in this. Uh -huh. Who doesn't have an interest in this? And don't you think, why, why does he have to mention that? Why can't we just talk about the facts of the case? Why do we have to pretend that there isn't such a mm -hmm. thing as facts, well, th which the, is what he's doing? The reason that he had to do that is because he's broadcasting from CNN. And because Sean Hannity going into that segment looks so bad because of the, the terrible journalism that he did, uh, you need to set up an enemy to him. So you have the bad-looking Republican, now you have the, the bad-looking Democrat, or at least the biased Democrat. 
And I loved, you were talking about his line of questioning, he had that section in the, in the, the middle part of that video about, uh, isn't this just objective to, isn't this just for them? You yes, know, yes. they don't like it, they're, they're distrusting it. Isn't that just their point it's of view? It's the truth to them as it's they the perceive it. Exactly, and that's CNN's like driving philosophy. There is no objective reality. There are only dueling political sides that we're going to showcase and then, no, nope, who knows who won? Who can, who can decide? We report, nobody decides. Um, and so the, the entire thing was, was depressing that he was treated in that way because this is one of my favorite examples of, of how easy journalism can be when you actually care about journalism. Make a few phone calls. Sean Hannity wouldn't even do that. I mean, he wouldn't have liked the results if he had. But nobody on his staff cared to look into the background of those guests, and, he, and then Eric Stern did. But I think that the, my really big question with that segment was where did those people come from, right? So how did those people end up in Sean Hannity's studio it, were they, did they present themselves to they Fox? Were did they were commenters on Red State, like, the, the Red State. I would, I, I, I'm I would just really public, confused about where they came from. They, yeah. they later, when given the facts, didn't even realize their own healthcare situation. So how did they come to be on a national television and, show? And how did they make it this far in life without dying so far? <laughs> like, you don't even know that you can get better health insurance than the stuff that is being canceled on you right now. What else don't you know about your own situations? Well, I think you can ask that about anyone in America It's like, right you know, now. if you hear those stats where they go, you know, 40% uh, uh, of the people suffer from diabetes and half the people don't know it. Well, how do you know it if they don't know it? And why don't you tell them? <laughs> so, no. <laughs> No, <laughs> Malcolm. No. It's not our job. We don't take sides on diabetes, pro-diabetes, against diabetes. So is that really the problem with CNN here? Is that, is that they're pretending that there isn't such a thing as objective fact? David Folkenflik, from, by the way, from NPR, which shows you the bankruptness of the reporting on NPR, yeah. that he thinks he's doing a good job here. This is horrendous uh, that he's attacking Eric Stern, the journalist, for doing the job, instead of celebrating him, he feels it's his, he needs to push back a little bit. Yeah. And even though he kind of gave him kudos at the top of the thing, he has to push back on it. It's, what's wrong with journalists? <laughs> well, I, what I thought is very, there are a couple of things that are really telling about this, uh, this piece. And one of them is when uh, Stern says, well, Hannity, you know, I mean, you know, he's a jerk, or whatever he says about Hannity. And Folk looks, he, he's, a, he's a little taken aback. He's like, oh, because you don't say things like that. Even about Sean Hannity, because Hannity is a member of our community that David Folkenflik, I think, is trying to sort of work his way up in. Eric Stern doesn't know enough. He's too much a part of the liberal, who, you know, uh, oh, you know he's, he's a Democrat who's outside of this media yeah. bubble. He doesn't know that you're not supposed to criticize Hannity that way. You're supposed to accept him okay. as the, as the right, and you are the left, and you, got, you yeah. can criticize him in certain ways, but you can't say that he's a joke. You can't say that he's a liar and he's an outright fraud, which is the truth. Right. Can I? Oh, go right ahead. Just something quick to add to that. I think it's partially, it's like the sort of collegiate respect among journalists that leading him, that's leading him to not want to see Hannity get insulted. But I think it's also incredible fear on the part of CNN that Fox could turn even more against them, attack them in some form. I mean, we're coming, we're broadcasting a day after CNN. Their last week, it was the worst week for ratings they've had in 20 years. And I think that they're, de they're lower than, than TYT, I think. They're deathly afraid of what Fox or the more established, better performing networks might do if they're seen to be launching blows at them, I think. But I think we're missing the point here, which is the fact that CNN is striving for something that doesn't exist. They are yes. striving for objectivity. Yes. And that's what, you know, when you go to journalism school, that's what they teach you. You know, I think about my journalism ethics class and I laugh now because I'm like, has it really changed that much in 10 years? Or like, did they really just not realize this is not reality? There is no objectivity. There's always a bias on one side or the other. And when you're taught objectivity, you're told you need to represent both sides. But what what if the other side doesn't have an actual viable point? What if there is fact and then there is someone's response to fact that is non-factual? That's not objectivity, that's presenting a fake reality. So, what so what I, th I think that's the situation that we've got ourselves in where we need to move away from the idea of being objective and just move into being honest. So when you asked your journalism professor that question, what if there is no other side of the issue? They, well, what I, what, was do they told, say? what I was told was that objectivity is this thing that you're supposed to strive for and it's what you work for. And no, you may not ever attain it, but you have to constantly, as a journalist, strive to be objective. Well, that's pointless. I agree. <laughs> so objectivity uh, is good for people who don't have the facts. But once you have the facts, I think it's okay to form an opinion and then kind of, but by the way, everyone does form an opinion. That's what she's saying, yeah. is that this idea of objective reporting 
is a canard, which it is a canard. And I wish we could go back to the days when each city in America had 10 or 12 newspapers. Yeah. There was the business newspaper, there was the worker newspaper, there was the socialist newspaper, there was the, you know what I mean? There was all different points of views, and it was where your reporting either was factual or was not factual. And I th it would be nice to get and back to that. And they also served as checks on each other, which on is each what other. this is about, which is my, I mean, my larger question about this segment is whether the mainstream media in you know our current atmosphere is capable of policing itself. Not whether they do a good job or don't do a good job, but whether they even could do a jo good job. And what do you because, think? Well, I mean, because what we're talking about is when you when you s pursue objectivity as your goal, that encourages people like Sean Hannity to, to to lie, to just make stuff up, because nobody's going to call him on it. The Republicans have figured this out. Yes. They know that the media is not going to say, "Well, Sean Hannity lied today, and here's the other side, which is the truth." <laughs> so, I mean, because because they can't do that, they won't allow it, and they're like, "Oh my God, this game is rigged in our favor, and nobody's going to call us on but it." But both sides lie. Let's that's not true. let's not act like it's just the Republicans. I mean, you've got MSNBC tells lies all the time. Absolutely, Both I agree. Both sides are lying. And even when you talk about the facts, well, what are the facts? Where do you get the facts? Where do the facts come from? They come from a think tank who did a study, who's funded by someone. The facts are not objective either anymore. So it all depends. I I would I would just make two points. I disagree that MSNBC is the equivalent, uh, left equivalent of Fox. It's not even. I don't think it's even close. I've heard that argument before. I, you know, it's uh, what Fox, what John, as uh, John Stewart says, what Fox News is doing is light years ahead of what MSNBC is doing, and it's because MSNBC is owned by a defense contractor who lets them say as much liberal shit as they can without cutting into their bottom line. Whereas mm -hmm. it's a totally different business model at Fox News. It's all bullshit, a hundred percent. <laughs> the time <laughs> from the top down, right? Their vice president, Bill Sammons, admitted that he goes on his own news show and bullshits people on purpose. Stuff that he knows isn't true. I don't think you'll find Rachel Maddow. She might have a liberal view at the facts, but she doesn't introduce false facts, which that's a big difference between Fox News and MSNBC, I think. What do you say, John? Uh, I agree with that. I, I would like to add one extra thing. So we've, we've attacked sort of the, the, spo the, the sponsors, I guess, the people who, who finance these, uh, these companies that put on the shows. We've attacked the, the actual people who host the shows. But I think we should attack the audience as well. Absolutely. Because you <laughs> pointed no out, I think correctly, that we have this idea of what journalism is supposed to be. And unfortunately, we don't have a political system that's worthy of it or that, that it works in. The, the rules just don't apply anymore. But I also think we don't have an audience that's worthy of some sort of classical idea of what journalism is supposed to be. Hannity lied to his audience. Fox doesn't care. They're not going to chastise him over that. But I don't think his audience cares either because they fundamentally do not go on his show to learn anything, to generate political sophistication. Correct. They go there to, to confirm their preconceived notions and to stoke the emotions they have towards politics. Mm -hmm. And he's feeding into that. So he did his job in that regard in what journalism has become today. And I think that's universal. I think that the, the real large problem is the fact that audiences aren't going out and looking at different viewpoints and different sources and actually, I don't know, um, consuming information and making mm -hmm. their own decisions. They're allowing other people to create and shape their worldview, which is so disturbing. I agree. But that's specifically to the, to the TV audience, especially. Oh, yeah. Online, you have much greater diversity. And that's why I think that But my... my <laughs> but you can, you can tunnel vision on online you too can, you if can. you only follow liberals but or you Republicans can't, but you on you can't Twitter. Do it. You can't not do it on if you just watch That's TV true. for the most part. I go to smirking chimp and I get mm. both sides, yeah. I think, equally represented. So that that's my you know my biggest peeve is I don't know what that site is you're talking about. It was developed to attack Bush during his uh, oh. presidency. It's still around. Oh, okay. RJ Esco oh. belongs there. Oh, anyway. okay, I got yeah. you. So they're starting a thing, you know, factcheck.org, which is from the Tampa Bay Tribune, I think, or yeah. St. Petersburg, something. something. Yeah, one of those Florida papers. And so they do factcheck.org, which I uh, found out has been incorrect several <laughs> times. Just my own checking. Factcheck.org <laughs> is fucking wrong about stuff. <laughs> And so they're starting a new thing called, um, they're starting to fact check pundits yeah. and it's news pundit shows. Facts, right? Pundit facts, something yes, like that. To go along with PolitiFact. So do you yeah. think this is a good idea, Jenny? Are you going to journalism school and all that stuff? No, because they could fact check me. I don't want somebody <laughs> to fact check me. No, I mean, I, sure, great, sounds wonderful. I, I don't think I would never rely on other people mm -hmm. to tell me what is true and what is false. I want to go out and find out for myself. And I think the more people that do that, the better. And then I don't know what factcheck.org's agenda is and all of this. I'll give you an example of what I think is wrong with the media, uh, th more so than just Fox News lying or someone else saying something wrong. 
Uh, it's the mainstream media is, uh, is, is the bigger problem, I think, than, say, Fox News, right? Because Fox News is preaching to the choir, as far as I'm concerned, and people who actually do want information outside of a po political agenda will go to, they think they're getting it from CBS, NBC, ABC, NPR, and they are not getting it. They are getting corporate talking points over and over. I was listening to KCRW here in Los Angeles yesterday. Warren Olney does a show, who I like, Warren Olney, to the point, and he was talking about the Obamacare. On. So he had David Frum on. He had the guy who developed Mitt Romney's website and he had a professor on and they were trying he kept asking them well how do we get costs down and none of them had an idea they're like we don't know there's really no answer nobody even mentioned single payer it never came up he did a half hour on how we bring down health care costs with three people Smart people in experts. America, experts, not one of them mentioned single payer, the, and everyone knows that that's the solution. So my thing is that we don't even get the right answers anymore given in our mainstream media. That the mainstream media, do you think the mainstream media has fallen down, John, right? In terms of, well, I, I mean, for a long time, like this is not new, I would say, but we've known for a long time that, that while you can identify all these different sources of bias in the media, the corporate bias, the, the establishment bias, mm -hmm. the authority, the, the bowing down to authority bias is, is going to be the most pernicious, yes. especially because while MSNBC will accuse Fox News of being conservative and vice versa, neither of them are going to point out the corporate sponsors that right. in many cases they share. Yes. And yes. so that, that is, it, it's perhaps the most dangerous because it's the most hateful. And that's what I also feel. Let me, let me add, ask you a question about uh, boycotts. People think that boycotts work to help silence a voice they find offensive mm -hmm. in the media. Like when they got rid of Glenn Beck and they tried to get rid of Rush Limbaugh and didn't work, but they got rid of a lot of his sponsors. And someone, now I say, oh great, you got rid of Glenn Beck. They replaced them with five more Glenn Becks. Mm -hmm. What, you, you won nothing. You're not getting rid of your opposition. You're just getting rid of one guy. And so someone gets on me because on my show, the Jimmy Dore show, I have a sponsor that's also sponsors Rush Limbaugh. And I'm like, yeah, but what about all those people who sponsor Sean Hannity? And what about those people who are Savage and Mark Le Levin? And so what's the difference? I mean, Ford, Ford co car company, they sponsor all those shows. You're gonna mm -hmm. you're gonna stop buy, buying Fords. You know what I'm, you know well, what I'm I think saying? It's, it's interesting that you bring up Ford because I think of it in uh, what John was saying is that MSNBC people uh, portray MSNBC and Fox as these you know bitter opponents, but in many ways they have a lot of the same interests. Their their ownership has a lot of the same interests, and we think about like car companies as being opposed to each other, and Ford and GM, and these are really their their competitors, but they have a lot of the same interests also. Yeah. They are interested in people driving cars more and the roads you know construction, and they're interested in keeping you know gas prices down and so they have a lot of common interests much in the same way that MSNBC and Fox have a lot of common interests and those are the things you're never going to discuss because those are because I mean th and this is my basic point about this whole topic is that mm -hmm. unless they're not the mainstream media is not going to talk about the real problems with the mainstream media because the real problem is the corporate ownership yes. of all of them and that's not going to get discussed so what happened was used to have the media was the watchdog and they would watch corporations and they would watch Congress and politicians and then the corporations got got smart and said, why don't we just buy, we're, we've been buying Congress for years and we're trying to hide it, why don't we just buy the watchdog? So now they own the news media and now there's no one watching anything or anybody, which is why we're left in the position we are in this country. John. One final point that I want to make, um, and this is just, I have to play devil's advocate, I, since I'm living now in this political and media climate, it does bother me the sort of bias that we see, but outside of a couple of decades of what we think of as sort of what journalism is supposed to be, what used to be in the, uh, the intro animated sequence of the newsroom, season one, where they, you, know, you see Edward R. Murrow and all that. Um, that seems like good journalism, but I think that we're fooling ourselves if we believe that prior to that, journalism was, was journalism is always, I mean, you had party newspapers for a long period of time, decades and decades. The only newspapers you had were sponsored by political parties. You've had um, the desire to, to, to stir up xenophobia and stuff like that. Like, there's always been a corporate influence on media. And so we should improve what we have now, but we shouldn't believe that we can go back to some golden age of journalism because I don't think it existed. No? I agree, and I think too, in some ways, we're better off now. I know that sounds strange, but at least now there's some level of transparency as far as what your host's bias is, who's financing, you yeah. know, oh, the station. Okay. So, I mean, if, if you're not smart enough to go out there <laughs> and think, oh, hmm, Ford sponsors this network and they're not talking about this huge malfunction, then that's on you. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Let me, we got to well, get I out. Also, I also think that the TV, you know, it's dying anyway. 
you know, TV is dying anyway, the TV news, I mean, the cable news, we talk about it, we make a big deal out of it, but not, not that many people really watch cable news compared to the larger yeah. population, and Fox News, the, the average, uh, I think the average viewer of Fox News is in hospice care, so, <laughs> I mean, th I mean th but th they're not going to be around much longer. At the beginning well, of that video clip, the host, uh, David Falkenflick, uh, said to Eric Stern, wow, you actually did some journalism. You called up and you followed up. And it, he said it like tongue in cheek, joking. But what does that say about journalism to you, Jenny, that he actually makes that joke that somebody, look, somebody did journalism and now I'm gonna question him. Go ahead. I mean, it's sad, but it's true. Yes. How many, I mean, honestly though, how many big name investigative journalists are there out there who are actually, you know, on the ground looking into things? We closed our bureau in a war zone for <laughs> one of our major networks. Like we don't put the money and we don't put the money into journalism like we used to, to do actual digging and reporting. I, I don't think that in many ways, real journalists exist except for a very small minority. And most of the people in America, when they see real journalism, think that those journalists should be put in prison. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, to be fair, Al Jazeera is trying a little bit in terms of the foreign reporting, okay. sending people yeah. abroad. Like that, they're trying a little Good bit. Good luck. I do like that the folk conflict is like, so you, 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 made, you made a phone call is what you said you did to, to this? To, to did, did you use a phone <laughs> book? Yeah, now, now what is that? What, what is do that you guys about? think about the media and the shit job they're doing of policing themselves? Leave it right down here, and we're going to come back with our second segment on the insurance. Obama insurance care scare tactics tactics hi welcome back to the point and our second segment we're going to talk about uh, the people who are beginning letters from their insurance companies informing them that their ins health insurance policy is no longer going to be offered because of Obamacare and then the insurance company offers them here's the new plan we're offering often much more expensive uh, this is kind of a BS tactic they're not offering them this uh, a more affordable uh, programs or more affordable health care packages and people are being tricked by their health care providers. Isn't that interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Now, Johnny, now you've heard about this. You saw the story that ta Talking Points Memo did about this. Yeah. Let me know what you think. Well, it, it's, I've seen multiple things that Talking point, Points Memo has said about this, and some of them have been incredibly positive, like the woman with diabetes who found out that her $591 a month plan is actually going to cost less than or $1.22 now or something like that with subsidies. And the people, there, are there still people in the country who are surprised that the insurance companies are trying to get more money out of the people? Like, I think you should have two stances when it comes, two emotional stances when it comes to corporations in America. Intense distrust and very temporary surprise and satisfaction when they, when they do something right. Like when Chase doesn't bill me for overdraft right. fees or something. Like, oh, that's great. Now I'm incredibly distrustful of you again. And that's how I will ride until the next time you do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And if people are actually trusting insurance companies, it's not, it's not coke. Like, get your emotions out of it. They're trying to get money out of you. That's all that it is. And the most frustrating thing is we're seeing all of these numbers being thrown around about the price of these plans. And I hate the way they're doing I hate the way o Obamacare deals with it that you have the, the price and then you have the subsidies that cut down the price. Because that means from here on out, for the next 10 years, every number you hear from everybody who distrusts or dislikes Obamacare, Fox News and all that, they're never going to include the subsidies never. and the cost of it. So you will never be able to have a rational discussion about it because they will simply lie about how much it costs. And that's, that's the world we live in now until people accept anyway? Obamacare. I mean, real, real, I mean, I agree no, with just you. No, actually lower the cost. Do whatever I it takes, like single you. payer, which we're gonna talk about. But don't do the, the fake cost and then the subsidy because we're just going to argue about Wait. numbers from here on out when we shouldn't be. We should, ar we should be arguing about systematic changes. Are you saying that the Obama administration has horrifically <laughs> mishandled the messaging on Obamacare? <laughs> I'm shocked. I think, I think everybody has mishandled. Both the opponents and the, the supporters of Obamacare yes. are all lying. Yes, every it's, yes, everyone is lying. Malcolm. Well, I think it's it's. Is it unethical? Go ahead. Well, dude, that's the question. Is it unethical? I mean, I was we going to talk yeah. about that. Is it unethical for these companies to do this? And I ethical. It's right, a company. That's right. Like the corporation. It's not it's, none. I don't See, know, but that's why you know they used to have <laughs> ethics courses in business school. Yeah, not I that I ever went, but I used to hear them <laughs> mentioned in movies and books and things. Ethics courses. No, and that's like a comedy class. Though. Oh, that's <laughs> <what> that, <laughs> yeah. Okay, it's, it's like physics real. for poets. Right. But yeah, it's uh, if you if you have any ethics, then you fail. But uh, <laughs> no, the but this is uh, this is interesting to me because uh, I, it feels like. Uh, uh, 
insurance companies, if they didn't do these sorts of things, that would be not unethical, but it would be contrary to their interests. And if you are not going to be trying to mislead your customers into sticking around instead of getting their cheaper plan through Obamacare, then you're doing a disservice to your company. Your job is to make as much money as you can. And that's, if it involves being unethical, if the law it doesn't stop you, then why should so you? So the whole, yeah. so everyone is a car insure, uh, car salesman then, right? Absolutely. Help everybody, well, you have like, to. I mean, if, if you go to the Exxon station, are, and they're, are they obligated to be like, well, we'd be glad to sell you this gas, but you can get it for 10 cents a gallon cheaper now at the, uh, the Shell station down the block, so mm -hmm. you should know that. No, of course not. They're going to try, I mean, and I don't fault them. I mean, it's our fault for having a, a, a market-based market healthcare, healthcare in, in system. system. And, and that's and why the, you need... The, the, the other thing is that the idea that this is like the worst of their offenses, and these are the insurance know, companies that used to do rescission. <laughs> and, yeah, you know, exactly. this is one yes. of the things that Obamacare got rid of, is rescission, where uh, you would you would apply to, you know, you try to uh, make a claim, and then they would search back through your whole medical history, yes. and they find out that you had to, like a, a, a boil on your ass lanced in 1972, and they're like, oh, sorry, we can't cover your throat cancer. Yeah. <laughs> That, yeah. They would do that shit. Yes, they, they literally... And so this, they're, you know, they're, they're misleading in their letters. Yeah, yeah. It, it actually, I find it really interesting because it's being presented a little bit like they're lying to their customers, and they're not lying to their customers. Right. They're just not telling them the whole truth because right. part of the truth doesn't work for their business model. And I, I don't really think we can blame them for that because, guess what, customers fall for it and right. they make money. I think if people are really upset that they're doing this, then change your insurance company. Not that there's really a better one out there, but- Or necessarily I'm, any competition whatsoever <laughs> in the state right. you live in. Right. But I mean, it's, it's, I don't think you can really fault them for not telling people, hey, you can actually uh, give us less money. Uh, I, I kind of agree with that. Yeah, I see. Hmm. It's that's different. our system. <laughs> it's so that's what the system no, is. You, you know, it's just, but it, when it comes to healthcare, it seems a little different. I don't know why that is, why? you know. There's like, sons of bitches. This is, but yes. this is yes. the problem with the For -profit healthcare, healthcare reform that we have right. is you, you're looking at it saying, oh, it's healthcare. We need to help people. And then you're <laughs> yes. throwing these businesses yes. in who their entire goal is to make a profit and expecting them to help people. Yeah, they help people as long as it helps their bottom line. Mm -hmm. So when you have a system where it's government and businesses, it's always going to be like that. Do you think government should regulate something like that, John? I, I think that they should regulate any behavior that they want to stop, and I think that they weren't specific enough in this case. I mean, the, the fact that there is a footnote in these letters is probably a result of a regulation in Obamacare Red saying Paul, that you have Red to mention Paul it. could learn from that. Have we <laughs> I'm sure that they were forced to mention it somewhere, but you should have said, no, you have to mention it front and center. Like, it's that sort of thing. You, they will do whatever it takes to make more money, and if you want to change the behavior, you have to very closely regulate it. And I don't think that they did that in this case. Now, we can't discount the fact that one of the big portions, uh, one of the big parts of this initial rollout of Obamacare is attempting to educate consumers about their options and things like mm -hmm. that, which is one of the reasons why I think the attacks on the website and the attacks on the implementation and trying to get people to distrust the service entirely are so malicious is because you are trying to instill ignorance in the people who are trying to make life and death, de death decisions. People will go into bankruptcy as a result of the, the insurance company doing this and the misinformation. People will die as a result of this misinformation. And people are using it as a political weapon when for many people it's literally life and death. And so that, as a, as a bystander watching this, is somewhat depressing. Wow. Okay. Well, you know what? You, that's a... Uh very poignant, John. We're gonna. I'm gonna end it there. I think we've said enough about this yeah. bullshit insurance company. <laughs> and uh, let's move on to our next topic, shall we? Now, um, John Stewart. We're gonna talk about another media watchdog, John Stewart. He recently criticized Kathleen Sabili and uh, and the Obama administration for problems with the Obamacare rollout. Uh, many commenters said the administration was in real trouble. Stewart then pushed back, arguing that his criticism doesn't have any larger meaning in the political discourse or mean that he's taking sides, right? So he says he's just a comedian. Other people say, no, you're having a big impact. Here's what Howard Kurtz has to say about it. This is a neat little game that Stewart plays. He wants to be a cutting edge media and political critic. Remember the rally for sanity in Washington? And he's good at it. But if you say he's having an impact, he says, "Bah! come on, I don't have any influence. I'm just a guy telling smutty jokes on basic cable. Look, making fun of something, that's nothing new for us. So don't act like us making jokes about a certain program or president is evidence that that politician or issue has reached some kind of tipping point for action. The point is this. <laughs> don't you use our jokes as evidence that the thing you hate must be stopped. Because I'm sure when we joke about 
you like, you're more than happy to ignore. John Stewart making fun of Obamacare was a symbolic moment. The same with SNL mocking Kathleen Sebelius. But these things matter. Do we in the media overuse these clips to oversimplify issues? We're guilty, John. We're guilty. Okay, so Howard Kurtz admitting that he's a piece of shit journalist, <laughs> uh, but still wants to make a point about John Stewart. Now, John Stewart's defense, when people give him more power than he said he wants or says he, he wants, is his defense is that, hey, I'm a comedian. I've been doing what comedians have been doing since they invented comedy. This is what mm -hmm. we do. I'm not, don't try to make this out to be more than it is. He has a point, doesn't he, Malcolm? I, I, he does have a point, but I think, and I love Jon Stewart and enjoy his show, and I can't stand Howard Kurtz, but I think Howard Kurtz has a point also. I think they, I, and I, it pains me physically to say that. <laughs> me too. Uh, <laughs> just to hear it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think, John, the problem is, and we talked about this in an earlier segment, which you should all go back and watch if uh, you're mm -hmm. only watching the segments instead of the full show, but uh, the problem is with our larger media landscape, where we don't have a, a diversity of viewpoints, and like uh, you were talking about having all the different newspapers who have all different perspectives and channels that are owned by a variety of different people, and so I feel like Jon Stewart, so much is put on him. He is our national bullshit detector, mm -hmm. and he's got to do it all because nobody else is doing it. Uh, nobody on CNN is doing it, nobody on MSNBC is doing it, nobody on Fox obviously is doing it, uh, people online are doing it, but he's the only person in mainstream cable TV who's doing it. And so, uh, so know, Howard Kurtz is right, he does have an influence. Well, the, you know, when people say that Jon Stewart has an influence or they go, wow, he's really doing some good journalism mm. uh, with Jon Stewart, and I both say is that, that's not, that doesn't mean Jon Stewart's a good journalism, that means the journalists are shitty. Right. And you have to turn to a comedian to get a modicum of truth in today's political discourse on television, which is the case, right? Because you look at MSNBC, people think they're skewed. Fox, people think they're skewed. People who say, I'm gonna watch CNN, they're right down the middle. We've realized there's not two sides to the truth. So when people turn on television, the only place they can actually go where a person takes a fact, draws a conclusion, and tells you about it is a goddamn comedy show. Mm -hmm. I don't have a question, John, say something. <laughs> well, look, I'll, I'll preface this by saying that I absolutely love Jon Stewart. He's, he's kind of my idol when it comes to, to journalism, actually. the way that he does it, the focus on bullshit, the focus on pointing out hypocrisy. But I do think that here he's being incredibly disingenuous. Both objectively, he does have an influence. I mean, you all remember the, I'm sure, the first responders bill that was yes. basically pushed through because of him. Uh, so objectively, he's wrong. And I also think that he knows that he has an influence. And I think he's trying to have an influence. For the most part, his show is, as you say, it's comedy focused. And the way that he does his comedy is through journalism. But very often, he does shows that are clearly journalism focused, and he happens to make jokes. I mean, when he focuses on an entire show on one particular issue, he is trying to advance an agenda. I don't have a problem with that. Um, and I do think that if we had a more, uh, f a more capable media, he would not stand out in the way that he does. The fact that they do uh, reveal, they, they have apparently the best archive of fi footage of politicians talking in the history of the world. They point out the hypocrisy, they follow up with people. Just last week, I think it was, they had the, um, the, the voter ID. They showed the obvious racial and political uh, underpinnings of voter ID laws. They got that guy uh, taken out of office because of that. He does have an influence, he wants to have an influence. But again, him attacking Obamacare, what the fuck does that mean? I'm if Bill O'Reilly's in favor of it, does that mean <laughs> that's a watershed moment? No, they wouldn't say that either. It's, right. I think it's really fascinating because it, people were actually using, as a, using it as evidence that someone should be fired, right? So it's like, <laughs> <laughs> he thinks this, oh, that we have to fire that person. And when we're, I, I think it's absolutely true that he has influence over what people think, what perceptions of things are, for sure. But him ha having a viewpoint on something, I don't think relates to oh, someone in our government that, like, that's not evidence they should be fired. I think that it's taken completely you know, to another level. Well, when they're saying that, look, even Jon Stewart is criticizing it, what that is saying, what's that implying is, John Stewart never criticizes Barack Obama right. or the Obama right. administration, which is the difference between a true comedian and a hack. A true comedian makes fun of power no matter what political party, which is what John Stewart and Stephen Colbert do. Yeah. And the people who aren't 
on his, uh, who don't agree with his politics can't understand that. Like, what you, why would you criticize people you agree with just because they're wrong temporarily? So that, that blows their mind, and that's what he actually does. He's an actual comedian, and that's what they actually supposed to do. Otherwise, you're not a comedian. You're a bullshitter, and you're supposed to be making fun of yourself at that point. And, and that's why Red Eye sucks, and the, the equivalent of The Daily Show they tried to run on Fox News yes. sucks, because they can't do that. They can't attack their side. Right. Not in an honest fashion. Not in right. an honest fashion. They, they will attack their side only when they deviate from the very carefully selected talking points and philosophy. Yes, yes. Um, but they can't actually point out their own foibles. As I've said before, conservatives don't do comedy. They're the reason we need comedy in the first fucking place. Yeah. <laughs> conservatives are the source material. Yeah, yes. They're a very important part of comedy. Yes. Them and Joe Biden. Okay, yeah. we got, we're going to wrap it up. That, this has been a great discussion. We're going to come back with another. We're going to talk about Jesus. Is he hip and cool? Come on back. We'll find out. He's not. <laughs> Hi, welcome back to The Point. I'm guest host Jimmy Dore sitting in for Anna Kasparian. And uh, right now we're gonna talk about, uh, there's been an effort by certain Christians to reach out to younger people to get them interested in Jesus because they're not. And if if people's parents don't make them go to church and when they're in high school, they don't go. Because sometimes high schools are smarter than their parents, right? Mm -hmm. So here's an effort, there's been an effort to make Jesus very hip. Uh, There's a guy uh, named Brett McCracken. He's the author of the book called Hipster Christianity. And here he is talking about this very phenomenon. A lot of these hipster Christians are, they are kind of trying to form their own communities because what they've experienced in the past, maybe the the church that they grew up in, was very kind of unfriendly towards intellectual things and artistic things. And and they're biased against that now, so they feel like they have to create their own different community. I think any time where the church is giving off this impression that they're not friendly towards something like art or intellectual matters, I think that's a bad thing. We need to work towards having communities where all these perspectives and all these passions and ideas can be collected into one. Okay, so that was uh, Brett Brett McCracken. (laughs) <laughs> not Phil. Funny name. Not Phil. It's, not Phil McCracken. Uh, but, and so he's also, he has criticized churches in the past for trying to become too hip. But uh, Pandagon blogger Amanda Marcotte, she makes the point that uh, this, all this hipness that they're trying to bring to Christianity is just sugarcoating the ugly underbelly of Christianity, which is discrimination, anti-women, anti-gay agenda in many evangelical sources, uh, circles. And let me say this, you know, I noticed this trend when they, when they started doing the Christian rock, mm-hmm. right? So, oh, it's Christian rock or metal cr- Christian rock. And to me, there is no such thing as Christian rock, right? So, because rock and roll, it was invented as a, uh, uh, inherently to protest the t- establishment, right? Rock and roll is, uh, is protesting. Right? Isn't it rebellious in nature? And so for you to slap this Christianity thing on it, it's just an in, it doesn't go together. It's like Christian porn. It doesn't work, right? Hey, look, I got a, a Christian dildo. It doesn't work. You can't say it's not real, though, because you know that one time or another, you've been in the car, flipping through the channels, and been like, ooh, I kind of like this song. What? Yes. Where did, when did Jesus Shit, come great. into this song? That has happened. There is no doubt that that has it's happened. happened. To everyone. Yeah, so you're listening to a Christian song, and you think it's got a good beat and easy to dance to. <laughs> and uh, the next thing you know, they're talking about the sweet, sweet love of Jesus. <laughs> and uh, you're like, oh, well, this, awkward. and then I'm like, oh, this isn't rock and roll. This is bullshit. And then I turn the channel. So uh, what oh, do you feel like making love to Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> Let it roll down the. Anyway, so uh, what do you think about this? And I don't know if you're religious or whatever. You don't have to. I'm not the man. You don't have to answer any questions. But uh, do you think this is going to work, trying to make Jesus hip to young people? Um. I- do I think it's going to work? It hasn't worked in the past. I mean, like you pointed out, this is nothing new. They are constantly changing and evolving, sort of, <laughs> um, to uh, try to appeal to the younger generations. But the problem is that we're growing up more open than ever before. And, you know, we, 
you know, want to accept other pe people of other religions. We want to accept people of other sexualities. We want to accept the fact that maybe women can do more than just be under the guidance of their husband. And until they change those issues, I don't think it's going anywhere. Well, God wants the man to be the head of the household. Now, certainly you listen to a woman's input, but in mm -hmm. the final analysis, it has to be the man. Well, I think we've noticed that you're the one leading this panel and not <laughs> me. Oh. There you go. You know why? Because there's a God. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Dore, the guest host, ordained by God. <laughs> <laughs> or Steve-O, you know, whoever. Oh, another guy. Do you, uh, what do you think about this hipster Christian movement, John? You have well, to have some thoughts on it. First you look of all, pretty hip yourself with your facial hair. Do I, do I look Christian? No. Uh, I should grow out my hair. Um, I get very uncomfortable when I hear about like Catholic leaders reaching out to young people. I think that they've Whoa. done enough of that. They should keep their hands to themselves, perhaps. Um, but first of all, and this is mentioned in one of the, the what are you talking about? we had. Yeah. I don't know what oh, you mean. You, you know what I'm talking about, specifically <laughs> you. Yes. Um, Hipster? That's supposed to be cool? First of all, nobody thinks that hipsters are cool. That's the only thing that you think about hipsters is that they're not cool. They're ironically cool to hipsters and hipsters alone. Oh. And so I think that they could have just Googled that. Like hipsters are not cool. Anybody who is trying to be cool, that will never work. Only, uh, the only people who've ever made a conscious effort to be cooler and had it work is like Justin Timberlake. He's like the one man in the history of this country. No one else can do it. You just look stupid. And the problem with Christianity is not that they're not wearing skinny jeans or that they don't, they don't have frosted tips to their hair. It's that their, their guiding philosophy and how they view different segments of our country and different segments of, uh, of our value systems are based on things that weren't true thousands of years ago. They need to change that. And they're trying to create a community that's open and accepting and tolerant. We have that community. They're just not in it. It's everything outside <laughs> of the church. <laughs> Leave the church and you can join that community. It's much easier oh. than changing your entire wardrobe. That is a good, well put, John. I think that that's ends right. the show. No, we're gonna, <laughs> we, we can do more. That was, that was really well put. Now, what do you think about the hipster Christians? Well, I think now, it, was, it was interesting when, uh, when he was talking about how the uh, church has been perceived to be opposed to art and that they have to be open to art. And what is art but uh, of you know, it's it's provoke. It's supposed to be thought provoking and make you question, and that's antithetical to what the church is about. I mean, you know, but they will. They have good stained glass, though. But back they in the will day. tell you. I've you know, I had the Christians who I've talked to, they'll say, "Oh no, we encourage questions. We all question, question." And then I always come back with, "Yeah, but you only encourage one answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> you don't get to have your own answers. Like, hey, I think this is all bullshit. That's fine. That's fine." <laughs> But the, the, what I, th I think there is a possibility for this because there is a precedent where something that is not particularly cool has made itself cool and so it's selling a product. I mean, if you look at it from a corporate standpoint, they're trying to sell a product, which is Christianity, to young people. And there are corporations like, you know, Pepsi or Apple or MTV who have taken what is a corporate structure and we're just trying to make money off of you. And that's what the church is trying to do too. We're just trying to get something Safe from souls. you. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and, and you package it in a cool, <laughs> hip way and, and convince people to buy into it. It's happened. But the problem is that Pepsi and MTV and Apple spend a tremendous amount of money figuring out the best way to do this, and they're very savvy, and they know what they're doing, and the church is not. We can't ignore the really awesome thing about this, though. So they're saying Jesus was the original hipster. Hopefully this will be the end, end. of the hipster, <laughs> because once something moves into kind of evangelical Christian mm -hmm. society, everyone Bracing else it. is like, ooh. No. Yeah, it's yeah. like if they embrace twerking, I think it would be over. <laughs> with be over. We should send them a letter about that. You guys, if you want to get rid of twerking, say it's cool. Yeah, right? this yeah. is like uh, yeah. you know the, uh, the the first time like you hear your parents saying some catchphrase. Yeah. Like my first time I heard my stepmother yeah. say, "Well, he's not a happy camper." I'm like, "Well, nobody's saying <laughs> that anymore." You yeah. liked that expression <laughs> before <laughs> that? <laughs> no, this was 1982. <laughs> <laughs> before oh, you were come born, on, John, <laughs> talk to the hand. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If. All right. Well, Jen, you get the last uh, comment. I don't. Do, would you like anything else to say about the hipster Jesus Christian? Um. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I'll just say I think the best example of a hipster Christian would be Noah, because <laughs> he was into woodworking. <laughs> he liked animals more than people, and he, you know, went against the crowd. So that's all I have to say about that. Very good. Very good. And he was against swimming. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's it. That's our show for this week. Let me help me thank my uh, my panelists, Jenny Churchill, producer at Pivot TV's Take Part, Part Live. Live. Take Part Live. That's right. <laughs> and uh, so check her out there. Johnny Idaho, we can see him and the Common Room and TYT University. And the main show on Fridays. And the main show on. People always forget that. Oh, yeah, main show on Fridays. Believe me. 
And yeah. uh, next to him, Malcolm, you can uh, see him up at his house in San Francisco. <laughs> and uh, We encourage all of no, us to visit him at home. No, you can see me sometimes uh, when the credits roll, uh, yeah. coming into the frame on the point here. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's something. Yes, a gentleman of scouts. The show wouldn't, wouldn't run without Malcolm, ladies and gentlemen. That's it. And you can check out me. My Twitter is right there. And uh, my podcast. I have a weekly podcast. And TYT Comedy. Check it out. All right, we've got over 150,000 uh, subscribers right now, so become one of the 151st thousand. All right, that's it. Thanks, everybody. See you next week.